purpose. There is a tendency to acquire the fire and think that it was just given so that we could become showmen instead of becoming showrooms. That what you have received from God is used to wow the audience that is around you, forgetting that you were designed to be God's templates of perfection where he had put you. So I began to hear a, a communication in my spirit which I believe defines the counsel of God or one of the counsels of God for this closing session. I hear God say, I want the earth. Somebody say that to your neighbor. We have tried by the givings of God to create some degree of impact within the walls of our churches. But God is saying there is something that Jesus died for that is greater than the walls of the church. That common yet least understood verse of scripture, John chapter 3 verse 16, says for God so loved the world. He had something in mind beyond men. He had systems in mind. So that if by the flames that are imparted in this congregation, you, 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 you do not end up on a pulpit, the fire is still not designed to waste. There is a land that every man has been allocated to come into. And in case Jesus has not announced that land, there is a place where you are in. If you burn that place long enough, then there will be a communication. Are you with me? So while you wait, while you wait, while you wait, till he shows up to assign you, there is a, a, a command to occupy. It means burn your location. That's how rockets fly. They set their house on fire. When the house begins to burn, they generate the energy that propels them out of the earth. Many of us are too idle. If we decide to harvest the oil on some people's head, they'll become merchants already. You can sell. You can sell. Because we keep getting impartations and impartations, forgetting that in the places where Jesus has located us, we were designed to burn for him. I saw a narrative in Zechariah chapter 1 and that's the only thing I'm going to speak about. My, my focal verse is verse 18 to 21. But if you please, yes, thank you. You, you can journey with me from verse 1. Just keep it here. The, 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 the book of Zechariah began with a prophetic indictment and God began to speak to his prophets trying to compare the current generation of Israel with the generation of their fathers. How that their fathers embodied so much of the graces of God, so much of the communications of God, bringing them into timely warnings, but they spawned the utterances of God. And God began to speak to this generation, admonishing them not to be like their fathers. That's how it began. And then from that communication, the uh, the, 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 the chapter continues into a vision of a horse rider that was sitting um, amidst marital trees. And um, this communication was to bring Israel from the place of indictment into the consciousness of God's undying love to recover his people. That's where I spoke from from yesterday. That if you gravitate towards the place where God speaks, you will find out that even though the church um, has been bedeviled by all kinds of depravity, the one who bought the church still lays claim to her church. So he brings to us tonight a message of comfort. I know that in wrath I have punished, in wrath I have, um, I have withdrawn certain things, but I am still that lover and my purposes concerning the church will come to pass. It was in bringing these words of comfort that the prophet was gifted a vision. And that's the vision we see from verse 18 to verse 21. The prophet said, then I lifted up my eyes and saw and behold four horns. Next verse. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah. Israel and Jerusalem. Now the Lord began to speak to me as his servant was sharing with us that 
Uh, when God looks at a territory, his recovery plan is built around these three identities. When God, for example, wants to recover a city, he does not start with those who are not his. He starts with these three identities. He begins with Judah, then he goes to Israel and he speaks to Jerusalem. Judah there is to depict kingship because in the day that Jacob was speaking over his sons, what he did was to cede kingship to Judah. I don't have the privilege to go to Genesis chapter 49, but just stay with me. It's a prayer point I want to raise. Kingship, kingship, kingship. It means that they are among us in the body of Christ men who have been chosen to be replicas of the kingship of God. Your essence is supposed to advertise the eternal king. Not just in utterance, uh, I mean, by utterance I mean in the capacity to declare and to declare, but in existence, the nobility, the royalty, the excellence, the separation, the consecration of a king, the dominion of a king, the power of a king. And the Bible says when these horns come, they attack kingship. So that the kings begin to function like slaves. They abandon their consecrations and they begin to walk on foot like mere men. The enemy goes beyond kingship and the second thing he attacks is Israel. And when we speak of Israel, Israel was designed to be a prophetic model of what God's agenda was. So they go for the prophetic. And if you're a student of scripture, you find out that the first time the word prophet was mentioned in scripture, it was not a talker. It was one who became a prophet by existence. Abraham was the first one who was called a prophet in the day that an alien king came and took his wife. God said, you are a dead man. For that man whose wife you took is a prophet. Abraham's life was lived as a narrative of what the purpose of God was. So you find out that even his error was captured into God's expression of his grace. He was a living, his life was a living narrative. That's how the prophetic dimension is supposed to begin. We get prophetic potency from prophetic existence. So what the enemy comes to do is to alter the existence of the people of God that God's templates in the territories are showrooms fizzle out and they begin to live like mere men. It's a conversion. The third zone where the enemy builds his territory is Jerusalem. And every time you mention Jerusalem, what quickly comes into your heart is the sitting of the temple. It means he attacks the priesthood. The bridge between God and man is destroyed because priest, the priests lose their consecration. They lose the educational system that was supposed to be a gift to humanity and because they, they, they pray but they lose the consecrations that make prayer potent. They think that much prayer will weary out a God who has captured in his word that it is the earnest heartfelt prayer of a righteous man that availed much. So we continue with the motions of priesthood but we abandon the righteousness component and then the enemy begins to have a field day. That's what the horns do. Now as I begin to bring these words to us there is the tendency to be hopeless. However the truth is when God annotates a problem he also gives us a list of the possibilities of mitigating the effects of what the enemy is doing and then the prophecy continues to say and the Lord shoot me for carpenters if you look carefully at this portion of scripture you'll find out that in verse 18 it was a prophetic engagement that sponsored the initial visions in verse um, 20 it was the Lord that showed. It means that from where you are, there are things that you can see. You can see the degradation with minimal labor. But if you will see the solution, God himself will need to bring it to you. Are you with me? So that the intercessor can pray when he sees a problem. But his intercession becomes more proficient when God begins by the economy of feedbacks to show him what provisions he had made. 
It is to say that no matter what the church looks like in Nigeria or the church looks like where you are, there is a solution in God. And a day has come where, must, where we must begin to seek audience with the one who shows. God is a revelator. And as you go back to your regions where you came from, he will reveal the answers to you. Yeah. I'm almost done. Verse 21. Then said I, what come this to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. Uh, I don't have time. I will have showed us from scriptures what these four horns were. How that they were, they were to depict about four kinds of kingdoms that came to subdue Israel. And I will have labored to give us what these kingdoms represented. But my focus tonight is not what the horns are. Because whatever the horns are, their targets are in this building. It is to take out Judah. It is to take out Israel and ultimately to take out Jerusalem until the witness of our God becomes cast in the territory. Church continues, but it loses his life. But God said, my answer is that I will send four carpenters. And so I began to stretch in scriptures to find out if there were any verses of scriptures that helped to, to introduce these this four dimensions that God introduces as his recovery mode and um, amongst all the verses in scripture, I seem to sit well with Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 10. That's where I close. It's, that's where we're going to raise the cry from. That the Lord will send forth from here four different kinds of men. As for the likeness of their faces, they had, they four had the face of a man. And when the Bible speaks of a man, it speaks of the reality of accurate priesthood. A man, a man. One who has become an accurate representation of his kind. So God is going to send from here a set of accurate priests who will go back to undo what darkness is doing. Two, it's the face of a lion. It tells, now one of the, one of the strongest points of a lion is that it's designed to be a territorial creature. A lion does not, does not um, adjust to cohabitation. It does not come into a city and then tells darkness to stay on one side and light will stay on one side. What a lion does is to ensure that the whole of the territory is under his government. God will, 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 will implicate the hearts of certain men in prayers with a cause that is more than themselves. I'm saying it will stop being about your local assembly it will be about an invasion in the city where you are domiciled. The third face is the face of an ox. And if you know what an ox looks like, it's, 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 it's marketing edge is strength. But what I saw in the ox is a twofold reality. On one side, it administers strength. On the other side, because of its strength, it becomes a burden bearer. It means that our mistress will rise men. Who will not live unto their needs, but will live unto the burdens of the heart of God. On the other side, God is going to cause men of strength to rise out of here. And you know, my, my consciousness of strength is drawn from my engineering knowledge. That strength is that ability of a material to resist deformation and indentation when it is acted upon by an external force. It means that there will be men of high consecration. No matter what the sin of the town comes to them, there will be nothing of him in them. That's what God is raising here. I know you think it's possible that everybody sleeps around where you came from. There is an administration of the spirit of God that shuts the door of penetration. That everybody lies and cheats where you came from. No, you are going back fortified. Titus 2.11 says that grace not only saves, grace, grace also has a teaching dimension and it doesn't teach just to inform, it teaches to posture a man so that when ungodliness comes, you have the capacity to look at sin in the face and say not here. 
Give me my verse of scripture. There's a last phase. There's a last phase. There's a last phase. There's a last phase. Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 110. It's the face of an eagle. It's the face of an eagle. It's the face of an eagle. Now, now you see, the, the, the eagle's marketing edge is discernment. It's discernment. And what God is saying to me is that in closing this conference, he will raise songs of order amidst us. Amidst us. The confusion that has bedeviled the body of Christ, the lack of accurate definitions, will be swallowed when these songs of order begin to emerge. Four carpenters. I don't know where you belong. But can you ask Jesus? Because there will be a sending for tonight. What I'm saying is he will send us four anointings. He will send us the anointing of a priest. He will send us the anointing of a territorial defender. He will send us the anointing of a burden bearer. And he will send us the anointing of a judge, a son of order. Wherever you are, you can grab the hand of your neighbor and place a demand on heaven as my session closes. Can you send us to put out that which the enemy seeks to do across the territories? Send us to put out the fires that darkness has lit across board. Yes, Let an accurate priesthood return. Jesus, let men who are bothered about territories, men who understand that the king wants the earth. Oh, Saiko Mahamo Mataba. We have just two minutes more to pray. Send us men who are headed into consecrated existence. Men of no compromise. Ali Anando, Kaboba Manda Bakatai, Avile Kabo Somiti Bilatas. And the bow batai aratata misa vitale and fetai the first kapa a poati likos everia kata kapa hata and pokambi asika akaka kapa letai let the sons of order ami aberias kevetas men with the discretion and the discernment of the ego. Oh, send us carpenters. Send us carpenters. Let the land be filled with carpenters who will fray the horns of the wicked. Ayana mo kate da vikarazate. Ay libaras. Enfatate teteza. Abrati vakado da driaka pohasa. Ay akatas. Adatete. Enabantatale. Antaperia sufiritalas. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I just have five minutes. In Jesus' name we have prayed. So, Father, in your faithfulness we ask that you will show us mercy and that you will anoint us as carpenters. Let the assault against the kingship 
the assault against the prophetic the assault against the priesthood come to an end let this tripod that was deployed by God across territories to make for territorial balance be rescued because you sent us oh Jesus come now Holy Ghost 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 across the building there, there are about there, there is a first wave of 20 individuals upon whom these four kinds of anointing will fall 20 individuals and I take my seat I have just three minutes so Holy Ghost all over the building can you come and anoint that will and anoint that will let the oil that makes for accurate priesthood come come Holy Ghost come come from my right to my left from the front to the back can you reach out and anoint tonight and the bomb beside me la vaca il libro cotile a sic ma ponve ai pocaito sameata oh jesus jesus anoint men unto consecrated existence let the capacity to resist be released be released you showed me 20 i ask that you will come i ask that you will come i ask that you will come can you send a few more to the territories oh, don't, you can stop playing you can stop playing you can stop playing send a few more to the territories send a few more to the territories lord send a few more to the territories oh you want men who will live off the buttons of your heart can you anoint them? Holy Ghost, can you anoint them? Can you anoint them? Let your hand upon them be tangible tonight. We need men with the discernment of the eagle. Sons of order. Sons of order. Sons of order. You showed me 20. Anoint them across the building. Let what that, the walk of darkness be put to an end. Oh, radito sai, aviamo vitatos, anglom breco vivico, ba atetezo sitai. This last one minute, Holy Ghost, help me and sit upon them. 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 Let your hand be stronger in the building. Let your hand be stronger in the building. There'll be no me without you. There'll be no me.